Let's take a look at the April alchemy. Hello and welcome to the treasured page. I'm Melanie and this is our quiet crafting space. And last time we had a good look at the different root vegetables that you can use to dye. And one in particular that shone out for me was beetroot. So we've looked at beetroot here and these are the results this wonderful ruby cherry red colour. So these were the papers. So if you haven't had a look at that, do have a look at the playlist for the April Alchemy uh, 2023 and you'll be able to find the beetroot dye video and see how I did that. So that simple process of putting the vegetable into the pan, I used all of the beetroot that I had in that bundle. So there were four or five good size beets that went into the pan. They were chopped up in one inch pieces so that that increased the surface area and it allowed them to cook through really. And then what was left was perfectly adequate apparently for my husband's lunch who then <laughs> set about eating some and that was fine. So it was the cooking water that was the dye and that was reduced down slowly, very, very slowly on a very low heat, over 45 minutes. So it was brought to a boil, then simmered for 45 minutes. So we've been playing with beetroot dye. That was really great. That's in its rawest form. That was just beets, water, in a metal pan, it was a stainless steel pan, but I have not introduced iron, I have not introduced alum or any salts or mordants of any kind. This was 100% cotton, which I've been using. Just this, which was an old pillowcase or sheet that I have been cutting up and just using for dyeing. Then this was a different process. This is where I put together some plants and I laid it out onto paper in a sandwich and then I submerged it and I simmered it directly in the pan with the botanical elements and this was with spice. So this was with turmeric. And if you've been following along, you will have seen that Brigitte over on Clee Black Creations, she put together some botanical images with the turmeric dye and then she was able to get this lovely yellow colour. So those colours are completely natural, so that's spice and the other one is from beetroot. So we've all already got some interesting colours for our palette and I got so excited about beetroot on the last video I decided to plant some seeds to see what would happen. I had some in an old packet that was um, out of date and here they are. So this is 10 days on and look what's happened. They have come up, all but these ones. So I think that that is an incredible yield of the seeds that I put in. You can see the beautiful colour of the stems there. But this is just indicating now that these are ready to be planted out and they will be planted deeper so that the leaves are on the top and then off they go. We do nothing else. We just let nature take its course. The birds aren't going to take the seeds because they have already been um, germinated. So there's nothing there for the birds, unfortunately. So as long as the snails and the slugs keep off, we should be on track for some more beetroot dye later on in the summer. So here I've got a swatch of fabric that was dyed with a beetroot and I've put my details of what I did under there so that one's all good. I've put some sewing in to keep my um, hinge connectors in. That's an avocado dye so we've got that within in these pages here. An avocado dye works in exactly the same way. You take your avocado skins and the stone as well, it all has pigment. These have been frozen. So what I do is when I've got an avocado, I just put the husk or the skin in a bag and it goes into the freezer. And then when I want to do a dye, I will take out a handful and I'll put them in the water and I'll just do exactly what I did for the beetroot. And we've seen that here before on this channel. Another thing you can do is put the skins out in the sun to dry. And so 
they become solid. Now good to be rehydrated in a dye pot. We've also seen avocado being used in journals here where I've got this background colour, this muted sort of almost ballet shoe pink. This peachy colour pink is an avocado dye and you can see it there as well. The darker pigment or the splodges, which I really like, but it isn't for everybody, is where it's come in contact with iron. And that is rusted elements um, have brought out the darker brown colours, but this was from a pan. So where it was a slightly rusty old pan, that is where all of this has come from and it is turned. Some of the areas are really dark, dark, misty, smoky grey, black and there's also sort of aubergine but lots of little flecks and I, I just really like, I liked that effect because it was something that I achieved through my experiment. So thinking about the alchemy, alchemy is where you add several things so when we've been extracting the colour out of things, we've been using water and we've been using heat. Those are perfect and simple applications to get the dye, but there's also things to enhance the colour, fix the colour and alter the colour. And I'm just going to bring a few things up here. So this is a bucket of rusty things. I've got some rusty nails here. There we go, so there's a rusty nail and um, in here is also some rusty bottle caps and these are, um, these are literally just picked off the ground. And there we go. So you could go for a walk and you could find yourself without much effort some rusty soda pop bottles beer caps and just some things. So this was this was a short walk around my neighbourhood and I have found a rusty pen knife, <laughs> there's some nails and some of the and quite a few of these bottle caps. So you know they have been washed so these have been through two dye experiments already so they have been boiled they have been washed if you're going to collect things like that do put some protective gloves on because you don't know where these things have been and also you do not want to cut yourself and risk tetanus or anything like that so if you're picking up rusty old elements from outside which is free and amazing because there's many applications for rusty objects. Do gather them up, do be excited by your find, but please do it safely. Have a bag or a box where you can collect all the things and then bring them home to clean and sterilize them. Now this is going to look completely gross, but this is a glass jar with the rusty nails put inside and then water has been added I don't know if you can see, it's really quite grotty. So this is rust water in a glass jar with water and vinegar. And the vinegar is the pickling vinegar variety. So that is the white distilled vinegar that you can get. Um, it's about 50p or something from Tesco's. So we just use that for quite a few applications within cleaning, uh, but perfect also for helping bring out a rust. Other things you can add to your kit for home dyeing and extracting colour, things to play about with to get effects would be salt, bicarbonate of soda, distilled vinegar. So this is alum. I've got potassium aluminium sulphate and this is the artist's version. So this can be used in paper marbling, um, and there is another one that you can get which is the food grade alum and that is for pickling. Now you could try if you've got one over the other you could have a go but I've got this one because I thought this would be more useful to me for artistic applications. So I've got potassium aluminium sulphate so again using gloves when you're using anything like this. You can make your own rust water it separates when it's not disturbed you'll be able to drain some off you can put it in a spray bottle you can then soak your fabric or 
paint it on your papers, let it soak in, and you may find you get a much better impression from your botanical eco dyes. If you're wanting to get some plant impressions, that is how this was achieved here with the rust water on here. So to make your own rust water, you would get a jar with a lid. You would then find some rusted elements such as the nails and put a whole bunch of rusty items in there. Fill it up three quarters of the way with cold water and then the final quarter I would use my vinegar and then I would leave that for a week and see where we're at and you'd start seeing the water would change a different colour. You've got your own iron water, it's a mordant that you could then use to help fix some of those colour impressions into your papers. So very simple, a little bit of alchemy, lots of videos out there about that. And when you come to use it you just drain off of it and paint it on your papers before you do the dye. It'll all get um, washed away in the dye bar. But what I am going to dye today is more copy paper, more fabric, and I'm, go I'm going to try and dye some of this silk that I've been given here from Terry over at Studio 989. I'm just going to cut myself a length, and then we can untangle that another time. So the roots that we've looked at so far are turmeric root in a form of a spice powder and we've looked at beetroot and now I'm going to look at one more root and that is going to be... That is the madder root. Now this, and this has been used as a dye, a red dye, for centuries and it dates back even to Egyptian times, that's how old this is. Um, it's something that can be grown here in England so we could even grow it ourselves and then dig up the root and dry it and use it. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take some of this madder root that I've been sent. So this is something that can be used as a health supplement. I have no idea what for but it does say that it can be used as a daily dose. So one teaspoon in 300 ml of cold water can be soaked for eight hours. Um, and then it can be drunk at 10 ml each before meals, but be warned, it can stain the urine red. <laughs> so um, we're not going to be doing that. We are going to be using it for the purpose of dyeing our cotton and our paper and our silk samples today. to extract the the dye. I don't want to drink it for any botanical purposes. Um, I, I just want to make something look pretty. That's why I'm here with this idea. So, all right, so what I'm going to do is wrap this glass jar in the fabric like that. And then I'm going to take this string, which I'm, I'm not wanting, I'm just using it here. And I'm going to loosely tie it on there and then I'm bringing my string round to hold my cotton fabric in place. And then I'm just going to tie those two pieces together. What I'm doing is I'm going to scrunch that all in together like that, bringing the rest of it up onto the pot, giving myself a nice scrunched effect there. Bring some of the strings over so that I can just achieve this scrunch. This is very loosely based on the shibori technique of fabric dyeing from Japan uh, where we are just doing a scrunched effect dye here. Okay, so this is going to be good enough for my example or certainly a sample of what I'm hoping will become a red fabric. And you can also buy this in a powdered form which can be used as a hair dye. So madder root traditionally has been used in cosmetics, particularly anybody using anything natural and wanting to use natural dyes. It's something that you can use in soap making to make a red swirl within your soap and it to be totally natural and plant-based. Looking at it, it's completely dull. It just looks like wood chip and there's no indication that there's any red pigment in there at all. It's really boring. So that is what it looks like. I'm now going to simmer it for 20 minutes and see what we get in the pan like we've done before. Okay, so I've decided to use half a litre of water here. So this is just plain water going in the pan there. 
So that was 500 mils of water from the tap. And then here I've got a ooh, tablespoon of the madder root going in. I'm going to bring it up to a boil very rapidly. We can either buy it in the raw form like that in sort of what looks like wood chips or it can be bought in a powdered form for the purpose of cosmetics and hair dye. So I've got this and this looks like the colour that I'm, I'm interested in already. OK, so we're a few minutes in. We can see we've got a brown colour tone coming out of the first one. That was the larger chunks of root. And at the back here, I'm going to add in double. I'm going to... I'm going to be adding in a litre here, so I want twice as much. And that's because I want to cover my glass jar. A rather loaded up teaspoonful of this powder, just because I think that this will probably be enough because it's been ground up. So that's going to go in there and I've just got to stir it in. I'll bring that up to a boil and then we'll come back in 20 minutes and have a look at that one as well. Okay, so this is the colour that I'm getting from this raw madder root which has been dried. So I'm not getting red. That is not red, is it? That is something that we can achieve with tea very, very inexpensively. So just to say we've done it, I'm going to dip it in here and really not not terribly inspired by that colour at the moment. I'm going to add that in there as well. And I'm just going to add in the cotton as well. So we've got paper, we've got cotton, we've got silk going into that very underwhelming 20 minute soak in the madder root. Okay, so that is at 20 minutes using the wood chip, sort of the raw variety. And this is at 20 minutes by gently simmering the powdered variety of madder root. You can see here that we've got this orangey tinge that's come out and is looking really interesting. The little tiny grounds are red, but the actual water isn't that red. So we're, we're going to um, put in some more papers and things on that one. This one, back on the hob, is starting to turn more like this so it's just taking a lot longer to extract the dye from these larger pieces which is expected so that seeping overnight would probably be be a good idea now looking at my experiments here and they do seem to be maturing actually as time has gone on just that little tiny quantity there has even matured and gone darker I quite like that and similar here it has developed a bit and it does look a lot darker than than 10 minutes ago so with that in mind that's quite interesting that I think you need to leave the things seeping in there, soaking in there for quite some time. But I'm also, I'm not happy with the depth of colour that is so pale and I'm really looking for something stand out here. So I've, what I'm going to do is that was only one tablespoon here. I've got plenty to play with and I can keep the dye when I'm finished with it. We're approaching 40 minutes here and this is how the chunky root one is doing. It is a more golden brown reddish tone, sort of a lovely orange actually, a burnt orange colour. I really like it. Um, so that's interesting. It's not red, it's not where I'm wanting to go, but I love what I've achieved so far with that. That's great. It's sort of an unknown mystery one here. I think we just have to leave these things, see what happens. Something I've never really played with, certainly not for the purpose of junk journaling, dyeing papers and... Uh, trying to extract colour for texture and different tones and interesting things. So it is a new one. So over here at the back here we've got this much more rich red tone there. And that's been sitting there for about half an hour now on a very low heat. Everything's on a low heat. It's um, sort of a simmer, less than a simmer really. There's a bit of a, a slight smell to it, a little bit botanical, sort of like wet, like a wet woodland smell. Nothing unpleasant, nothing I haven't smelt before. 
just I haven't smelt it in my kitchen, if that makes sense. It's, it's sort of, oh, it's like a wet day in the woods. That's what it smells like. I'm going to put in another scoop. Now the other thing I want to explore more is the alum. I'm going to make up a solution here with the alum. It says here to dissolve two teaspoons in a litre. Well I haven't got a litre, I've got half a litre here with me so I'm just going to do one teaspoon and then I'm going to dissolve it with some hot water. It's not bo whoop, about that. It's not boiling water but it is hot water. If we are going to be really scientific about it, I live in a really hard water area, so this water will also have a bit of calcium in it uh, from the chalk deposits, because we're here on the south coast and we have the chalk hills. If you have seen any films involving Dover and you've seen the white cliffs of Dover, um, I'm nowhere near Dover, but we still have those white chalky hills, that uh, chalky substance for the water to percolate through. So we do have a slight calcium deposit in our water, which makes our water hard. And that will, of course, maybe add to the results or change the results to what others get elsewhere because our water is going to be different the world over. So we also have to maybe think or factor in the mineral content that we have in our everyday tap water or drinking water. So that is nicely dissolved. That was very simple and straightforward. And I've put that there so that I could um, soak my fabric here. I'm wanting it to maybe take up as much of the colour that it can get. Um, so I'm hoping that just by rolling it into this hot mixture of alum, which I feel like I should now be wearing gloves for, but uh, it's diluted and uh, I'm not really getting too soaked, but I will go and wash my hands in a minute. Right, so I'm just going to lift out this silk here. You can see it's a very slight pink colour, they've all gone different colours. Um, and then over here we've got the cotton, the silk and the paper. So they're, they're interesting in the sense that they have received an ageing effect because they've got the darkened edges and definitely look a bit more worn so if that was on a bigger piece of fabric for a larger quantity or something that needed aging or any effect done to it certainly for turning it into a more old world piece or vintage piece or something from another era uh, maybe antiquing lace this could be a nice gentle way a natural way of doing it without any additives at all and you can see here actually in the daylight in total sunlight um, very subtle colours but what would happen if I add some of my iron water in here what if I could just get a little bit in there will that do anything Let's just add it in there. Will that change? Oh my goodness, look at that straight away. That's really interesting. So why didn't it do it over there? Well, that is very interesting. This one changed instantly. We can see that that has changed to black instantly, a bluey black. And this one didn't change at all. So let's just add in some paper. A scrap of silk. So this process is called saddening where we add um, the, ele the iron elements. So we'll just put some in like that and see if we can 
get a colour. So back from the hob, this is the madder root which has been simmering and seeping out a colour for for an hour. I'm not going to do any more than an hour. Anything that takes any more than an hour is going to lose my interest and I won't want to do it in the future. So if I can't achieve a result in an hour then then I'm not willing to commit any more time to it because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do that. So there we are. Now I do know that madder root can then be seeped again overnight so I'm quite happy to put that in a jar and leave that overnight in some cool water and see if we can get any more colour out of that so that's fine because that's now a waste product so what we can do with that is of interest so I will seep that but here is the result of that so th that was the result I drained it off and we've now got this dark brown dark dark walnut brown actually interesting and this is strained so this is now this beautiful color this is a really lovely orangey color so that's had rusty nail water put in it those two they they were additional experiments this is what it looks like so that's where we were at 20 minutes this is what we look like at an hour let's just put in some more of this paper and see if we can get some interesting colour. So we've got pale brown, we've got a pink, we've got an orange, we've got a brown. We've got a bit of a rainbow of colour effects going on here which is interesting. And this is just one way of extracting colour. Uh, it may be that the root doesn't like that, it may be that it likes to sit and seep for absolutely hours, days even, to get that depth of colour to come out. So this one was strained and by that I mean I took all the bits out and just filtered it through some of this paper and this was how it looks. So that was the colour, that was the paste or the residue colour from the madder root and it's that that's probably quite interesting so it's funny, isn't it? It's our filter papers, it's our drop sheets, it's our napkins and it's the things that we use to mop up that create the interesting effects and colours. But I think that that is just... I don't know whether that is enough to make a stain on a paper or whether that is just bits of wood, bits of the root... What I'm learning is the more you get of the root, the deeper, the richer, the darker, the colour that you're probably likely to extract. This is a fascinating subject and something that you could really throw yourself into. For that whole feeling of being self-sufficient and back to nature, just a nice little slow down hobby that you could have in the background. Something as gentle as growing something and then turning it into a dye and then using that dye to make a product, an end product that you could then work with in a craft and, and use to make something really meaningful from literally from the start of that seed through to the completion of something, that whole journey, that whole artistic cycle that you have delved into is a is a wonderful slow down healing process in anyone's book and it has always been so that's nothing new that is something from time before way back when Egyptians and uh, medieval times this is something that is really really quite it's in um, our footprint it's in our it's in our background, it's in our roots, it's, it's farming, it's part of cultivating and that's where we've come from, all of us. Our ancestors at some point had to grow things, they had to, to survive. So it's a deep rooted, literally rooted, wonderful thing that you can do to just calm down and, and focus in with nature and if you can't bear that sort of thing if it's not quick enough it's not instant it's not the quick results the excitement if the idea of slowing down and having a process that takes weeks is really just doing the opposite for you then that's fine you 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 can you can still use natural products, but you can find a quick way. This has taken less than an hour and we've got a black, we've got an orange, we've got a brown, we've got a pinky colour here, we've got something else that might might manifest over the, over the night to give us a tea stain for some papers. 
So 20 minutes of boil, we get that colour. Not very interesting and certainly haven't used very much at all. So not enough has been used. But after one hour, we have extracted a much darker colour and you can see that that is a darker brown colour. It's not red, so therefore it's not very interesting. Um, if we add the iron, rusty iron and vinegar water, we got grey and a silvery colour on this, on this silk, which I absolutely adore. So I'm going to be doing some more of that. So I've discovered things that I never would have known about. I love this silver grey tone for the, for the sari silk. So we've started out with that and we've ended up with grey. Not much different there, but that one is. That's a more that's a more warm brown tone here. And then this is lovely and this is beautiful. So definitely seeing some interesting colours. The dye bath at the moment has had another spoonful of the powder. So it's had three tablespoonfuls into one litre of water. So that's just under a quart of water with three tablespoons added. So when I went back to go and add my third scoop in, I'd realised that I had thrown in a sample of fabric. I'd just thrown some in while I was coming back and doing this. It's on the hob receiving general heat. So the difference is heat. And what I've got when I've dyed it and when I've thrown it in there is this. It is covered in bits. But that is with the addition of heat. So that's a cold dye in a little pot and I'm getting that. But this was from the hob so there we go. That is just the mantra here is to keep going. And that is what we've got at one hour using the madder root powder with no mordant. So forget that. This with nothing, just a piece of cotton thrown into the dye bath on the hob has given this colour. And that is after one hour of the two spoonfuls of the madder root allowing to seep out the colour. So now, before I kind of realised that that was as dark as that, I've thrown in a third and I've put my glass jar with a crinkled and I've put another one of these in with the mordant, which was alum. And now I'm considering just throwing in one without any mordant at all because that seems to be okay but I don't know if it's colour fast. The other thing is I've got some spots here which could be a splash of the mordant. It could be a splash of alum uh, in which case that changes things that makes it more orange. So I don't know what's going to come out of the dye bath next really. It's um it's a mystery. I'm so encouraged by what I'm getting here now and I'm really excited to see what colour comes off of that scrunched up fabric and I've just folded up some dry fabric here. I've got some scraps and I'm wondering if I could do sort of a tie-dye effect there by just dropping it into the residual dye bath when I've finished uh, doing what I'm doing uh, for my experiments and then what I'll do with that water is I'll dye my paper and so we'll carry on with that dye until we've got a lovely array of different things to use in our artwork. So I'm going to dye that as well. That's going to be dropped into the dye bath and it's so brilliant if I'm getting that colour. Um, I mean that's lovely as well so I'll probably do, in fact let's just use that because that's just beautiful. This, this colour here is beautiful. So we'll have We'll use that up and then I'm going to get some more. I'll just soak that. I'll get some more and I'll and I'll see if I can get the darker red. So I'm just doing a concertina. Folding it one way, then folding it the other like that. Uh, I think I'll get one more in there. OK, I have to go tighter with it just to pull them in. So we'll do that all the way down. So there we go, that is going to go in the dye bath with that one. Okay, this has been on a gentle heat now for 25 minutes. All right, so I'm just going to get that out. That looks incredible. 
All right, this is cotton that has just been soaking in the alum. Just going to dump, put that in samples. There. It's just experiments. And then I'm just going to add in these. So one is completely dry. That's just cotton with no mordant going in. And then this one is one that is wet. So that'll be different. That one has got... Ooh, it's interesting. It's making a fizz. Uh, so that has got the alum on it. And then this is just our other one to go in there as well. So I'm just going to leave that now slowly seeping in. Let it just sit there. It's just on a number three heat here in the UK. And it is just, well, well, that has just come apart straight away. So it didn't like the elastic bands. So the elastic bands have popped off. Okay, so I now don't want to move that about at all. Okay, it's the next day and the results are in. I lost light yesterday, so I decided to cut my losses. I've left some of the samples to just mature overnight. If there was any extra dye, then it could just do it. I had to down tools and just have a break and I went to bed and now I can show you what I got up to. So... <laughs> These are my slightly underwhelming yet also fantastic papers. I have got three different coloured papers going on here. So I've got some pink toned ones and this is with the mature madder dye at the end. So I once I had used the dye for my fabric I then used the dye to dye my papers and that was um, a cold dye and we would see we were seeing that the cold dye was producing paler colours. So it was the heat that was really cooking it into the fabric. But for papers, it has just come out pale. So I've got some tones of red there, so it's definitely possible to achieve a dark colour. But I think I would have had to up the quantity of the madder root powder and really have perhaps cooked my papers almost in a boil. So that's something to try. I will maybe do that when I put them in for eco printing. I will put in some madder root powder as well and see if that gives me some interesting effects. And then I got this really interesting effect from the madder root. That was the wood chip style one and that has produced some interesting brown with a mottled effect, so a really cool aged effect. Reminds me of the sand on a beach. And then I've got the grey with some interesting marbled effects. So those I really like. They're really interesting. So there we go. We have got three different colours. They're extremely subtle and that's what I was able to do with the paper. So not, not, not the bright vibrancy as we were hoping. Then I've got this back from the dye bath. First of all, look at this sari silk. It is absolutely gorgeous. It's this really lovely orange colour. It's sort of that flaming June colour from the pre-Raphaelites paintings. It's just beautiful. It's got a shimmer to it. It's a real peach colour and it is really, really pretty. So that I'm pleased with. This one is a nice buff colour, very cool for antiquing. That, that was from two scoops of the Madder dye and just dyed cold. So this was hot and this was cold and the difference is really obvious. So you really need to cook it in to the fibres. Then we've got these two fabric samples here. Right, so this is with two scoops and without a mordant. This is just cotton going into the bath um, without the alum. So that's just plain cotton going in, two scoops. These are the three scoops. Now one has alum and one was without alum. But because I've gone to sleep and I've forgotten, I don't know which one was which. But this one has transferred better. Um, but it's hard to say and this one has got lots of bits on it which need brushing off so you can see it's all coming off that's the beauty of this tray it actually shows up what's going on so that really wants brushing off because the color of it is a bit deceiving once you take all the bits off but I love it it's really mottled 
and it's an interesting colour. Get down here and see what we have got. Just remove the string which has acted as a resist to give us a really interesting striped effect. Okay. Oh wow. And there we go. And there's a full spectrum of colour. We've got yellow, we've got orange and we have achieved a quite vivid red. So that is where it was folded under. And we've got that. Th oh, that's even more interesting on the other side. String, which is now mottled. And then I've got these which are soaking wet still and they are covered in the dye. These fell apart, unfortunately. The binding just didn't work out. But uh, we'll see what we get. Well, there's definitely some folds. But it hasn't done the square folds. Just the paste of it is just caught up. So it's a messy business. Definitely messy. The elastic bands and seeing if we've got something interesting here. Well, it's definitely possible to achieve some form of tie-dye or shibori techniques here, but I'm not sure if I'm 100% excited by my results there as a piece of fabric. But as a first attempt and as a sample, it's quite interesting. They all want to be left to dry and then we can have a look at it all at the end. Well, just look at the fun array of colours and textures and interesting designs that we can come up with just by using two products. So to conclude, you need heat, you need alum and you need a good length of dyeing time. The, you also need a good quantity of your dye. So that was three tablespoons in a litre of water and I would say that the more fabric you start adding, the more fibre, you're definitely going to need more of the madder root dye. The experiments that you do will produce different results because of the water that you use, because of the different quantities that you use. There's a different depth of colour there, you can see what you prefer. These, these are really lovely, warm, fiery colours and they can be used for summer, for that moving into full colours and then things surrounding festivities at the end of the year. So these colours will be brought into the journals at all times. Nice to have little samples and scraps and this is unreal, look at this, I mean... We've certainly achieved an effect there. I love this bit swooping down here and this looks so reminiscent of maybe an animal print. So a really interesting technique um, and something that would look great maybe with the grey. Maybe that could be, maybe that could, we could look at that and bring in the rusty elements and see if we can get the grey colours, black and grey. And before we know where we are, we've got zebra print. <laughs> And uh, who knows, who knows what we can achieve. So there we go. I hope that that was of interest. You've certainly seen how rusty water will change a botanical dye and that it works exactly the same for an avocado. So if you start adding your rusty nail water into an avocado dye, you will create a black dye. So one minute you'll have an avocado dye and then you add the rusty water and you will end up with the black. You'll end up with the grunge grey, but that could look amazing on a smoky grey piece of fabric and give you some really interesting techniques and te textures. So things to really think about there, things to have a go at and it costs you nothing. It's just a walk looking for some rusty elements, water, vinegar, bit of old fabric. And we'll be back with the next video very soon. 
and we'll have a look at how the April Alchemy Journal is coming along. So thank you so much for joining me. I hope you found fun and value there. Do please give me a like and a thumbs up. Leave a comment below with your own experiences. And if you've used Madder Root before, do let me know because I'm definitely experimenting here. And don't forget to have a look at my coffee shop page and download the freebie April Alchemy Challenge digital images here and then you will be able to cut them out, fussy cut them and add them to your own projects. They are completely beautiful and designed by Brigitte from Klee Black Creations and the link to everything is below. And, uh, subscribe to the channel if you've enjoyed watching me today. And above everything else, just slow down and make crafting time for you. Bye bye now. <laughs>